Welcome. Thank you for joining us for the basics of ranked choice voting administration. This is the fifth webinar in our spring webinar series titled The Future of American Elections. And we are so glad that you could all join us live today. My name is Deb Otis. I am the Senior Research Analyst at FairVote, which is a national election reform and advocacy organization primarily focused on election reforms like ranked choice voting. And so our topic today is ranked choice voting administration. Have you ever wondered what it's like to administer a ranked choice voting election? If for our election administrators in the audience, of course, this is an important topic, or you may just be curious about what resources or consulting are available. And so today we have partnered with the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center. The Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center provides information, research, and tools to teach the public about ranked choice voting. They have decades of election administration experience at all levels of government, and the Resource Center provides ranked choice voting best practices and real world materials, as well as ranked choice voting consulting services, expert testimony, and implementation guidelines. And so today, Chris Hughes from the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center is with us and will provide you with a brief presentation. And then we'll move to a discussion with election administrators on our panel who have firsthand knowledge of administering ranked choice voting elections. And as we go, please feel free to uh, submit questions and we will leave some time at the end to answer those questions. We look forward, we look forward to addressing your questions. Let's start by introducing the panelists. We have Dr. Amanda Lopez Askin. Uh, Dr. Askin currently serves as the county clerk for Doña Ana County, uh, leading an office that services a diverse area, including a vibrant border community. Born and raised in Las Cruces, New Mexico, she was appointed clerk in 2018 and was elected for a four year term in November of 2020. Amanda administered the city of Las Cruces first RCV election in November 2019, which saw an approximate 27% increase in participation compared to previous years. Uh, that election also included an unprecedented nine candidates for mayor and prioritization of intense voter education. Amanda lives in Las Cruces with her husband and five-year-old daughter. She's a proud alumnus of New Mexico State University, where she earned three degrees, including a PhD focused on leadership and administration. Amanda, thanks for being here. Uh, next up, we have Chris Hughes, who is the policy director and counsel for the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center. Chris makes sure administrators, activists, and policymakers are speaking the same language when it comes to ranked choice voting, from legislative drafting through election day. He has worked on RCV legislation in more than a dozen states and has presented on RCV implementation to the Washington State Association of County Auditors, the Maryland General Assembly, and others. Chris, thanks for being here. And next up, we have Dave Triplett. Dave has worked in election administration since 2003 and is currently the manager of the Ramsey County Elections Office in St. Paul, Minnesota. David has been involved in two statewide recounts, was a member of the team that implemented Minnesota's first online election judge training program, and has conducted many ranked choice elections using a hand reallocation process for the city of St. Paul, Minnesota. So thank you to all three of you for being here and sharing your expertise with us. Uh, we'd like to kick things off with a uh, Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center presentation. So I'll hand things over to Chris, who will briefly introduce election administration and the major questions election admins have to consider when starting with RCV elections. Thanks, Deb. Uh, I'm going to start sharing my screen with my presentation. Um, everybody can see my slides. Beautiful color scheme, our new logo in the top left. It's very exciting. Um, yeah, so I'm Chris Hughes. I'm the policy director for the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center. I'm really excited to be co-hosting this webinar uh, with Deb and with FairVote today. Uh, like Deb said, I'm the policy director. I think I already said that. It's been a crazy week, so apologies if I repeat myself. Um, but we are, I'm the policy director at the Resource Center, and we, like Deb said, are a, a resource for anybody who's interested in learning about ranked choice voting, especially from the angle of administering ranked choice voting elections. Um, so I'm, I am gonna provide just a quick introduction, about 15 minutes, maybe as fast as 10, to the major questions you, election administrators are, are probably thinking about when they're thinking 
about or implementing ranked choice voting elections, especially for the first time. Um, this is just a bit more background about us. We provide resources for election administrators, policymakers, voters, candidates, and anybody else who's interested in learning about ranked choice voting. Our website is www.rcvresources.org. If you want to go and get any of our voluminous documents, we have a lot. We have a lot of information on that website. Um, so the agenda for today. Um, I like to always start a presentation about ranked choice voting with what ranked choice voting is. I'm gonna try and do it quick because I assume a lot of you are at least somewhat familiar with it, but th some of the some of the like the angles and corners of ranked choice voting do matter when you're talking about election administration. So I wanna be sure we, we get at least a baseline there. Then I'm gonna try and define election administration as quickly as possible. It's a complex thing that I've distilled into a hundred words and I'm sure it's both, it's not nearly enough, but uh, we'll see how you all feel. Um, and then I'm gonna talk a bit about the major things you have to consider, the big things that change when you're running a ranked choice voting election. Things like designing ranked choice voting ballots, making sure your voting equipment can handle ranked choice voting, that sort of thing, that sort of thing. So what is ranked choice voting? Ranked choice voting is a voting method where voters rank candidates in order of preference. That it can get counted in a lot of different ways. Ranked choice voting is actually an umbrella term for a couple different methods of election. Um, we, all of these methods have a lot of different names associated with them, but single winner ranked choice voting, the one most people are familiar with is also called instant runoff voting. Proportional ranked choice voting, which is used to elect multiple people at once, is also called the single transferable vote. And these types of election have in the past been called preferential voting or proportional representation. There's a lot of different names, but all we really need to know today is the term ranked choice voting. So how does it actually work? Ranked choice voting works by, with, like I said, voters ranking candidates in order of preference. There's a sample ballot on, on this slide right here uh, on the right side. You can see if, if a voter liked George Hobus the most, he, they would rank uh, George first. If they liked Althea Sharp second most, they'd rank her second and so on until they ranked as many candidates as they can stand. Once somebody casts their ranked choice voting ballot, these ballots get counted in rounds. The everybody, we count up everybody's first choices first. And if somebody has enough votes to win, they've won, that's it, that's the election. But if uh, nobody has enough votes to win, the person in last place gets eliminated and has anybody who voted for them has their votes transfer to their next choice. So that's a, the basics of the function of it, how ranked choice voting works and what it is. Um, it's being adopted more and more widely in the United States. New York City is scheduled to use it for the first time in their primary elections this June, actually, and has been using it for special elections this uh, winter and spring, for example. But it's used in a, a million other places, of course, Las Cruces and St. Paul, for example. So with that out of the way, what is election administration? Here, I'm gonna read out this definition I wrote for myself. Uh, I'll let you judge for yourself if you think it's good enough to capture this. Election administration is the acts and processes underlying the conduct of elections in the United States. It's going through growing pains as elections become more and more professionalized and technology driven. Hierarchical and decentralized all at once, it's the best and worst thing in American elections. At base, it's infrastructure. It's the infrastructure of our democracy. It is how we get our elections. It's made up of a lot of people and a lot of sweat, a lot of tears and a lot of computers. So that's election administration. Um, there's a ton of, there's a lot that goes into it. We're not gonna be able to get into all of it today, but that's, that's how I try to define it and scope it for people. It's also, I think, worth remembering that a lot of election administrators, people who are running elections, have a million other jobs to be doing as well. They're county clerks, they're county recorders, they're city clerks, they're secretaries of state. They have a lot of other responsibilities on their plate that aren't just elections. Um, it's a myriad number of things. For whatever reason, nothing specifically comes to mind, but there, there's a lot of other responsibilities someone who's an election administrator also is responsible for. So, 
how do ranked choice voting and election administration interact? Whenever we think about ranked choice voting, when we talk about ranked choice voting, I think the thing, the thing about ranked choice voting is it feels like it can change everything about our elections from, from top to bottom, how candidates campaign, how people vote, how votes get counted. There, that it's so much about the process that ranked choice voting can impact. So it feels sometimes really overwhelming to think, how does it apply to administration, to the, this infrastructure side of elections? Uh, and we've seen that in practice, there, it, it will change a lot. It'll change how voters interact with the process. It definitely changes how election administrators have to approach their jobs. But the major parts of election administration that ranked choice voting changes are voter education, ballot design, voting systems, and results reporting. Um, I'm also curious, I, I would love to talk after I'm done presenting if uh, Amanda and David have any other ideas, like are there other big things you think we should capture in this umbrella? But that's where that's what I'm gonna say for now. So I'm gonna just briefly go through each of these things um, so we can get to that discussion. But first, voter education. First of all, what is voter education? I, I mean, it might be self-evident. It's teaching voters about the election. It can mean a lot of different things though. It can mean making sure voters know that there's an election coming up. It means making sure candidate voters know uh, what contests are gonna be on their ballot. It's, and this is where ranked choice voting comes in. It's making sure voters know how to fill out their ballots properly. It's making sure voters understand how their elections actually get counted, how people win election in these elections. So on the screen is an example of a piece of voter education material from the city of Minneapolis. There's a million different ways people have done voter education because it is, it's for ranked choice voting, I mean, because every jurisdiction brings their pre-existing practices and maps ranked choice voting onto them. They're not, they, they don't have the time, they don't have the resources to do a whole new thing. They're just gonna fit ranked choice voting into what they're doing and how they think about their voters and voter education already. This flyer from Minneapolis shows the major focus that I've seen from ranked choice voting jurisdictions. It's teaching voters how to complete the ballot. That's the big focus, making sure voters know how to cast a ranked choice voting ballot. You see on the left side of, of the flyer, um, there's a sample ballot, an example of what a ranked choice voting ballot looks like in Minneapolis. Uh, it's properly filled out. And then on the right, there's a couple examples of what not to do in your, on your ranked choice voting ballot. Um, what is not here is an explanation of how the votes get counted, um, which is, a, it, that's an interesting thing we've seen in a lot of places is there's a much bigger focus, especially as election day gets closer on marking the ballot right. You wanna make sure voters understand how votes get counted, but that's something that voters continue to learn more about the more they interact with ranked choice voting. Um, they understand it better and better after each election cycle. So there's a lot of ways to run a ranked choice voting campaign. I'm not gonna try and describe all of them because it's, you know, <laughs> there's too many different ways to do it. But the, the big things that um, we've seen jurisdictions do are sending these sorts of flyers out to voters, making sure there's these materials in polling places, making sure voter or uh, ballot instructions, sorry, are, are really clear on, on their ballots. Um, sending out voter guides to everyone in their jurisdiction. I know this is something Minneapolis does. I'm actually not sure off the top of my head if St. Paul or Ramsey County does as well. Um, but there's, and you can put out ads, you can run ads in TV, you can go door to door. That's something a lot of ranked choice voting advocates do to do voter education that isn't coming from election administrators. But that's, that's sort of the basics of voter education for ranked choice voting. Then you have ballot design, actually designing the ranked choice voting ballot. This, there's a bit of a paradox in, in my experience with designing ranked choice voting ballots. In theory, they're relatively simple to design. You, we, on this slide, uh, you can see some best practices, ranked choice voting ballots from uh, the Center for Civic Design who we worked with on a project designing best practices for ranked choice voting ballots a few years ago. They found that either of these kinds of ballot, voters will mark correctly. They, they will understand it, they'll, they'll use it right. Um, so long as you design it pretty closely to these standards. 
But in the real world, actually fitting ranked choice voting onto a ballot, making sure it that you can, you know, that your voting system can do uh, can let you design a ballot in a clear way that you manage the hundreds of or hundreds lots of different contests you may have on on a ballot or or in an election cycle, making sure um, you know that you've accounted for every factor on your ballot that's not just ranked choice voting can get really, really complicated. Um, but so, so I, I just wanna sort of draw out that tension. There's a lot of, of thought and, and consideration and time that goes into designing an effective ballot overall and ranked choice voting, there's best practices for it. And it's also very hard to do, uh, to design a really effective ranked choice voting ballot because there's a lot happening on American ballots already. Next, we have uh, voting systems and ranked choice voting. So first of all, what's a voting system? A voting system is the thing used to uh, program, design, and run an election. It's, um, there's, there's a lot that's going on in a voting system, but the major things that might make sense to this audience overall are it's used to design those ballots that I was just describing. It's, it's the hardware that's in your polling places that captures votes. It's the thing you use um, to actually count votes and, and determine the results at the end of the day as well. It's a huge mix of different computers, different software, different hardware distributed all throughout an elections jurisdiction. Um, every voting system, the, uh, every jurisdiction, every city, every county, every state has a different voting system. Um, it's this is part of the like decentralization that is incredible and and uh, awesome and sort of the bad way about elections in America is so much varies everywhere about how voting systems operate. Um, but the the thing to keep in mind is. There are a few major vendors in voting system world. There's, I'm not gonna name all of them, but all of them, their most recent ranked choice voting equipment or most recent voting equipment can actually do ranked choice voting elections. They all have very uh, varying um, capabilities when it comes to that ranked choice voting capability, but they can all at least design a ranked choice voting ballot and capture data from that ballot. On this slide, uh, I have examples from a couple different vendors. Dominion's ballot is on the left. Hart, uh, their built-in ranked choice voting ballot is on the right. Then we have, this is from Unison, which is a relatively smaller vendor. Uh, we have ESNS. This is the ballot from Maine's elections in 2018. Um, and and that's, that's my summary of voting systems and ranked choice voting. As with all of these things, there's a lot more. I'm just trying to scratch the surface and, and get the topic out in front of all of you. But this is a really major part to get right with administering a ranked choice voting election because the ability to use your voting system for ranked choice voting in an effective way, in a, an efficient way, will really ease the implementation process for ranked choice voting. Um, and then finally, displaying results. So. Actually, displaying election results uh, can come in a lot of different ways in ranked choice voting. There's a lot of different visualizations people have done. Um, but even beyond visualizing those results, actually getting those results is a whole other uh, a new thing to consider in implementing ranked choice voting. You need to figure out how you're going to get all the ballot data from your uh, polling places, from everywhere people cast ballots to one place to run your ranked choice voting count because you need to centralize ballot data in a way that's actually relatively unique uh, or new for ranked choice voting. It's, it's uh, novel compared to previous forms of election administration in the United States. Um, I know, <laughs> I'm sure David has some stories about um, centralizing actual every single ballot because they hand count their ranked choice voting elections manually human count these ranked choice voting elections in St. Paul. And, you know, I, I think it's hard to think about the data process when you're using a voting system, but I can only imagine, you know, the amount of work that goes into getting um, all those, all those different pieces of paper, 
paper, keeping track of all those pieces of paper, getting them into one place and running your ranked choice voting count securely, efficiently. Um, so anyway, I, I hope that helps excavate some of the major questions that election administrators are thinking about and are approaching when they're thinking about implementing a ranked choice voting election, whether it's for the first time or for the 10th time. Um, so that's, that's my presentation for today. Really excited to be here and looking forward to the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. That's very helpful. I will remind everyone that this is being recorded. So folks, please continue submitting your questions and we will address all of those at the end and then have this resource available uh, as a video to share with other colleagues and friends afterwards. At this point, uh, I'd like to get into a discussion with the panelists. So I would love to start with Dr. Askin. Uh, Las Cruces held its first RCV elections in 2019. So you are our newer admin on the, on the call today. Uh, so could you just tell us about your experiences administering ranked choice voting for the first time and what changes did you have to make to become ranked choice ready? Sure, so first of all, thank you so much for having me today. I'm very uh, pleased to be here. I've seen already the questions that have come through and those are frankly many of the same questions that I had. Uh, I was appointed, I think they, they mentioned that in my intro. And so I, frankly, my very first, the very first thing I had to do was I had to become a ranked choice voting expert, right? So I had, I say expert like that because you can always know and learn more. And I always say like, I'm gonna toss the really like complicated numbers uh, questions over to Chris, uh, but I really had to understand ranked choice voting in a way that normalized it for the average person and didn't um, kind of make it this really um, heavy, difficult thing because I would be talking to an electorate that had so many different, um, you know, ages, um, backgrounds, understanding, and political views, right? And so we can never underestimate where those political views necessarily will come in as well, as I found out. So the first First thing I did was learn as much as I could about ranked choice voting. I did things like I had my uh, staff rank things in the office. Uh, we were coming up with a new logo. And so we picked three or four and then we had them rank and we could show them really how it worked. So when we had people call in, they had a good understanding of how they could explain it to voters in a very simple way that was hopefully helpful to them. Um, so the city, so to give you some context, Doniana County is located in the southern part of New Mexico. Um, we are you know, very fortunate to live in a very vibrant border community and we kind of swoop on up. We have about 250,000 approximately uh, in individuals that live in Doniana County um, and our voter roll is about 130, a little less than 130. Of those, um, less than I believe 60 were in the city of Las Cruces. So Doniana County was administering an election for all the municipalities, water boards, school boards, but Las Cruces, the city of Las Cruces was the only municipality that had instituted ranked choice voting. So one of the first things we did was we had to, I live in the county, I don't live in the city limits. I frankly did not get a ranked choice voting ballot. Uh, and so that's something that initially we had to talk to people about, well, you may not see the ballot, but if you do, so right, so figure out where this will fall within your county. Um, the second thing I had to do was do my best to partner with the city of Las Cruces and the officials there. And they were fortunate enough to be able to put some money behind some voter education, including in, uh, putting it into electric bills. Uh, and I think I probably between myself and my uh, chief deputy did anywhere between 50 and 70 community presentations the two months leading up to the election. And that, and I did any kind of public forum. I did these a uh, hundred different times. I did, you know, um, public radio, public TV. I did uh, city council meetings, uh, county meetings, anywhere and any time I could be in front of a group of people that could talk about ranked choice voting, I would do it. Very often there is an idea that this is a progressive uh, movement. And so um, I would go into groups that did not necessarily have that perspective. And it's really actually more important to go in those kind of groups because those are the ones that are very, very concerned. Um, you know, I think one of the things that is the most important thing, and, and I come from a mental health background, which has been very helpful in elections, quite frankly. Uh, but one of the things that I think it's important for all of us to do when we are doing voter education is even if somebody has approached me in a very 
frankly, aggressive way. They're angry. They're blaming me. I'm changing their system. Uh, I validate their concerns. And if you're coming to me with a concern about the electoral process, if you're invested in it, then we're already on the same page and we already have something in common and let's start from there. And then I validate some of their concerns in terms of like, I'm hearing you, I understand what you're saying. Um, there was a question I think um, specifically from one of the attendees that asked her, her electorate is, is older. And I did quite often get some of the most resistance from um, people that were older. They wanted it the way they've always wanted it. And we'll talk about this more and then I'll stop and, and feel free to let um, David chime in. Um, but one of the things that I don't even know if the RCB group is super happy that I say this, but what I tell people is if voting ranked is going, using RCV or an instant runoff is going to keep you from the ballot box, vote what I call classic. There was another person that asked, can you just vote one? Can you vote two? Can you vote three? Let's say there's 10. Can you just vote? Yes, you can. If it's going to keep you from the ballot box that you absolutely don't want to participate in RCV, my perspective as somebody who's a voting advocate and an educator was to say, if you just want to vote how you always voted with that one person that you want to win and move on, you can do that. But please show up to the ballot box. That is something that we don't want to ever keep what we're doing away from you. Um, so definitely saying that, but also remind that if they do that, and it subsequently does go into runoffs, they have forfeited their right to participate in the subsequent what we call runoff rounds, so to speak. So I know that was a lot in the span of a few minutes, so I'll stop and, and allow others to speak. But um, obviously, I this is something that um, got under my skin in a big way. So um, thank you for the questions in the chat, by the way. Thank you. Uh, I'd also like to hear from David. David, you're uh, our veteran admin on this call as uh, St. Paul has had this in place for a decade now. So I'd love to hear about your experiences and whether changes have been made uh, after having this in place for several years. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for the questions and thanks for having me. You know, after 10 years, it's kind of hard to look back and see uh, what has worked and what hasn't. It's kind of just, after 10 years, it's kind of just how we run elections in St. Paul. Uh, for more than half my career now, that's how we've been running uh, the elections in St. Paul. I think um, in terms of uh, what would need to be changed or what we have changed over the course of 10 years, I'd say real minimal. Uh, in St. Paul, uh, or at least for uh, the state of Minnesota, uh, ranked voting can only be authorized by charter cities. Those are cities that have a charter uh, that dictates how they run their elections. Most cities in St. Paul are statutory cities, uh, and there's no state law that outlines redistricting. Um, so in St. Paul, uh, because they're a charter city, they, in a sense, have full control uh, of how ranked voting will work. So if the city feels like something isn't working, <clears throat> the city council uh, can, by ordinance, uh, change those rules because the charter said we're going to have ranked voting. Uh, and then it defaults to the city council uh, for how they want to set those rules. So in the 10 years uh, that we've been running uh, ranked voting in St. Paul, I think the most obvious change was the layout of the ballot. Uh, and to Chris's presentation, where you saw either the, I think it's the grid method, or we call it each choice is a different box. Um, I think uh, fair vote or different groups could say one is more preferable to the other. Uh, and we did find some of that from voters. Uh, but for us, the need to change uh, was actually to make sure that the ranked voting office would fit on the same ballot is all the traditional offices in a special election. Uh, so in St. Paul, their elections are held um, on their own. They're not concurrent with any other election. So when you vote in a St. Paul uh, election, you only get one ballot and it only has ranked choice voting on it. Uh, the school district does have traditional voting, uh, but that's on the other side of the ballot. <clears throat> but when we had to have a special election in an even year that coincided with a governor's race, we needed to fit that ranked voting race onto the same ballot and having some variation in how we lay that ballot out uh, allowed us to do it. So our big change was going back to our city council uh, in 2018, so eight years into the system, uh, or maybe seven, excuse me, um, to ask for that change. But really that's the only change, uh, large change that I think would be pertinent to election administrators. Um, so in a sense, you could take that, uh, that it's either worked out very well um, or people are oblivious, but I'll let, I'll let the, the, the group here decide what the case is there. Thank you. 
so I'd also like to hear some more details on what is next for your jurisdictions. You know what, we've talked about some of the things that have worked in the past. I'd love more details on what you're hoping to change for the future. What would be positive directions for ranked choice in your jurisdictions? Uh, maybe we could start with Dr. Askin and then move back on to David. Sure, so, you know, with, with 2019 being the very first time that that we did administer an election this way. I think moving forward, we're fortunate to, uh, we have a new city clerk who's excited about doing voter education, is very invested, has made it a priority in her budget and with her staff and her media partners. And so we didn't have that in 2019. And I think that will be invaluable to the city of Las Cruces voters because uh, they will start maybe a little earlier and it'll be more consistent and and she will lead that, so to speak. So that I think that is very helpful and, and we're happy to support her as much as as uh, we're able to we didn't have that necessarily in 2019 frankly so this will be great for our community i i just don't think you can uh, undersell voter education piece but i would like to link some of what i think is really helpful um, when we talk the, about the checks and balances and elections in general, I know in New Mexico specifically, we have things like handmarked paper ballots. Um, we have um, the certification of machines. That's a public oh. process in which you know voters ca can participate um, and and come and observe. You know our community are able to do that. Um, we have poll officials that are made up of you know uh, very diverse political you know, backgrounds in order to to serve. Um, there's all these checks and balances that we all have in our electoral process. And I think when we do voter education, not just about our CV, I think it's also helpful to add those items to the voter ed that we do so that the overall faith in our electoral process is increased just by telling them all of the checks and balances that we do have. So I think I will continue to promote that. Um, you know, it has been a, it has been a very trying um, year or so plus in, in elections. And we continue to have to battle misinformation, which is really, you know, with, uh, voter suppression and and by doing by offering voters more information about how we secure their elections i think that that will help them also have faith in rcv i also think referring to rcv simultaneously as instant runoff has offered a great a sense of comfort to some voters because they understand runoffs they don't under necessarily understand ranking Although we do rank things every day, um, for, you know, in, in, in reality, we do. If I don't want to see this movie, I'm going to see this movie. Oh, that one's not available. I'm going to go to this one. Oh, I can live with that one. I absolutely don't want that one. Also, encouraging the idea that when we think about democracy, we think about our community electing officials in which the majority have put some level of support behind um, the, the subsequent winner. So when we talk about five candidates, um, you know, and the actual winner wins at 28%, that doesn't necessarily speak to what we had originally intended, right? So when we have somebody who's won during ranked choice voting with the 50 plus 1%, we know that 50 plus one have put their faith on some level or another, it could be I can live with that person, I'm going to rank them, uh, but they've put some level of support behind a candidate. And so that means collectively, so has the, the community with that margin. And how about you, David? Um, those are great answers. What, are, what else are you looking forward to? What, what are you looking to perhaps improve in the future? Well, I think for anybody uh, in the ranked voting world, this won't be a surprise, but for those of you who might be new to ranked voting, uh, in St. Paul, uh, we do not, uh, we do not uh, tabulate our ranked voting uh, total uh, using our voting system. We do it by hand. So our voting system will count the first choice votes like, like it would in any normal election or traditional election, I guess we call them. Um, but our voting system stops there. And so we need to take it the rest of the way uh, and we physically do this all by hand. And so our big push in St. Paul uh, and across the rest of the state of Minnesota is to move to electronic reallocation. Uh, and I've been looking through the chat here, uh, lots of good comments. I don't think we'll get to most of them, unfortunately, with time. Uh, but I do see one where somebody brings up, uh, is there concerns with the delay in reporting results? Uh, and in Ramsey County, uh, I cannot compare us to New York City because uh, we're only about 150,000 uh, registered voters in St. Paul, 300,000 in the county. Uh, but in St. Paul, uh, it takes us about a full day to two days to do this hand reallocation. And so if the election is on Tuesday, 
uh, by the time we've recovered all our materials, done our first round of audits, uh, we're usually not ready for the event until that Friday. Uh, and then usually Friday evening or uh, that weekend, uh, we have a result. Um, so I'll let you decide if that's timely enough. Uh, in the city of St. Paul, most of the candidates in um, public know this is how it's going to work. And so they expect it. Uh, but I think the reality of uh, the 21st century and what people know for what technologies are out there, uh, we could have that result a lot quicker. Um, so why aren't we there? Why aren't we just doing this tomorrow? We all know the technology is out there, the universal tabulator is out there. Uh, well, in Minnesota, it's really the voting system certification, which is a security uh, process to make sure that voting systems aren't just used, uh, that they've gone through testing from the federal level and the state level. Uh, and at this point, it's our Secretary of State's position uh, that they cannot certify a system to, for ranked voting at the local level. And without any state laws, they have nothing to certify against. So we're kind of in this uh, game with the state legislature to give us something to certify against. Uh, until then, at least in St. Paul, we've been advised by our county attorney's office that uh, we have to have a certified system. Uh, so we'll be doing it by hand, but uh, our team is actively working uh, with the state, with um, different vendors out there, Universal Tabulator is one of them, uh, as well as with our colleagues to try and uh, jump over this big hurdle so we can move to electronic reallocation, which will then give us a lot more data than sitting and watching us hand count and having to do your own tallies to get that data. So that's what we're really focusing on uh, going forward. Then we can get uh, a quick and accurate result out to the public. Um, and, and I will say in, in our community in Las Cruces, um, we were able to have our results, I think, I want to say about midnight that night, but we did have Domin Dominion system that did a, you know, an algorithm that they had already pre-programmed and validated through our certified um, vendors and systems. So that was not, thankfully, I, I frankly cannot imagine um, that, but I wanted to talk to a comment really quickly, Dan, um, in response to something I said, and he's correct, the voter who ranks only one candidate does not forfeit their right to participate in instant runoff unless their first choice is eliminated during the runoff process. So um, I want to make sure that's, um, that's put out there because he's correct. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I would love to ask one more question of Chris and then get on to uh, all of these audience questions that have been coming in. So Chris, will you give us a quick reminder uh, for our election admin watchers and our election admin fans, uh, what resources are available and remind us where people can find them? That's a great question. So I, there's a few answers I'll give. One, every ranked choice voting jurisdiction, uh, Dona Ana County, Ramsey County, Hennepin County, which is where Minneapolis and a few other ranked choice voting cities are, San Francisco, soon to be New York, every single one of those jurisdictions is an incredible amount, uh, an incredible resource for information about ranked choice voting, for how it works there, how their voters interact with it, how they run those elections. Our goal as the Resource Center is to, you know, get as much information from those jurisdictions as we can and get it onto our website, rcbresources.org. We want to be that clearinghouse for ranked choice voting election information of like how ranked choice voting elections are actually getting run. So I'd say ideally come to our website first, but there's we're a small team and there's a lot of ranked choice voting elections happening these days. So we're not always 100% up to date. So I'd say come to our website first. It's, it's designed to make the user, make it as easy as possible to search through our extensive library of resources. And if you can't find something, go to that county, go to that county's website get in touch with that county and see what they can give you and what they can tell you. Because, I mean, as we're learning today, election administrators are, are such valuable resources. They, they really know their communities and they know how their voters, you know, interact with ranked choice voting and fair vote. Great, thank you. Uh, we have seen so many great questions coming in from the audience. Uh, let's go ahead and pivot and start taking audience questions at this point. Uh, so let's start off with, are there noteworthy differences in election administration when using RCV for party primaries versus nonpartisan elections versus partisan general elections? Uh, I'd love to hear folks uh, have your take on this. Feel free to uh, raise your hand and jump right in. I realize any of you might have an answer to this. 
Well, I'll jump in then. Um, I can't say the difference between party activities uh, and uh, what's happening in caucuses versus primaries. But what I can talk about is in regularly scheduled elections, uh, as Chris said, Hennepin County is just, you know, three, four miles over the river uh, from me here. And that's Minneapolis. I'm in St. Ramsey County, which is uh, St. Paul, the capital city. Uh, we both have ranked voting. We have incredibly different methods uh, for how we do that. And again, because there's nothing in state law, um, we're kind of at the whims of our city councils to write these ordinances. And so we have vastly different um, uh, rules uh, than Hennepin does. So I don't know if I'm answering the question directly, uh, but there are big differences for how you can do it. Do you rank up to six? Do you rank up to three? Do you have unlimited rankings? Um, and I, I don't want to get into all the nuances, but uh, you can have very different methods. And I think uh, having the city council debate those and have them in that open forum, as a result, I think in St. Paul, we got a system that works really good for St. Paul voters and a system that the St. Paul voters, I think, are comfortable with because uh, we don't hear too much at St. Co uh, city council meetings uh, about discontent with the system. Um, but uh, yeah, you don't need to go far. A few miles, I'm by the river. Uh, you have a totally different system that uh, works for them, but, but might not work for the folks here in St. Paul. You know, we actually, we got a question about ranking limits too, which um, your, your answer there, David, uh, uh, brought this question to mind. Uh, someone asks if it's common to allow, uh, uh, to limit the number of rankings allowed. Uh, has that happened in the in Las Cruces or in St. Paul? Well, I think it was something, frankly, that we were worried about when we started to see the amount of, of candidates for the mayoral race. There was room for 10 on our ballot and we had nine. So at the end of the day on candidate filing, we were definitely, if, you know, trying to see Okay, there's a tent. I mean, definitely, you know, we partner with our Secretary of State, who's awesome and, um, you know, very supportive. And there, they can always, you know, they have special rules for, you know, very specific election code, but it is something that I don't think we have solved. And it's something that definitely, um, you know, we need to look at further. I do know the city of Las Cruces uh, decided not to have any um, of, um, I'm sorry, I'm spacing it, but the, the, the requirements to, to become a candidate were minimal in terms of what they were, signatures, I'm sorry, they, they decided to eliminate the signature requirement. And so that I think really led to there being more, more candidates. The great thing about it, and uh, somebody alluded to, uh, asked a question about this connected to the youth, is we had a great diverse, you know, sc scope of candidates from, I think, a 19-year-old, um, you know, up and coming Latino real estate agent to, you know, you know, candidates in their 60s. We had, and you know, ironically, I think, especially with the discussion around the politics behind RCV, which people have opinions on, that the May, the mayor, um, our incumbent mayor won. He won, um, you know, I think uh, through, uh, but again, we went through all of the nine rounds to get him um, as the final, the final uh, candidate that had 50% plus one. So the status quo candidate did win, despite some of the, you know, assertions that for sure it was going to totally, you know, kind of wreck the system um, and, and that there was going to be something different. And, and frankly, that didn't necessarily happen. I think there's a funny quote from the mayor because he was part of the, you know, the city council that voted it in, um, albeit maybe reluctantly because he asked, was asked, you know, what do you think about ranked choice voting now? This is after he won. And he said, Oh, I love it. I won, you know? So I think that was something that, um, that was, you know, held its own kind of irony. Uh, we also got a question about what is the most effective way to depoliticize ranked choice voting? Uh, Dr. Askin, you, you spoke about this a little bit as an issue you encountered. Did you, what were some of your most effective ways to counter that? You know, the community education, which I present to people and frankly, sometimes places that are sometimes actively hostile is I think important because when I'm in front of a group of people, whether it's 10 or 100, 
I'm humanizing me as somebody who wants to just teach you and help you understand. I have no political agenda other than for everybody who is eligible to vote. And I continue to talk about that in every which way that I can and talk about the safeguards that we have in our elections. Again, when we talk about those who have had concerns about ranked choice voting and have said, I'm just not gonna vote, um, I try to, to do my best to encourage them to you know, show up at the ballot box. And you know, regardless of our political differences um, or similarities, my purpose is to administer an election that is fair and nonpartisan. Uh, this RCV in our community is uh, connect, you know, very, it's a nonpartisan races that it's connected to. Anyway, so that is helpful in itself, but I am an elected official, which in its, its very nature carries its own um, baggage. And so I have to carry that baggage and kind of unpack it when I do these events uh, where I talk about ranked choice voting. I, I wasn't on the city council that voted this in, but at the end of the day, I am, administering this election, I want you to have all the information to make the best decision you can um, connected to how you're going to, how much faith you have you're going to in voting, but almost hopefully that you will, right? So that's, that's kind of what my role is in this. Thank you. Uh, next up, I have a question that uh, I'd like to direct towards Chris. Uh, we got a little bit of an opposition question here. The question is, are you familiar with an academic paper from 2015, which uh, examined ranked choice voting for ranked choice voting elections and found a, a high rate of ballot exhaustion? Uh, are you familiar with it and how would you react to it? Yeah, so I, I, I have read this paper and I think I have two responses to it. One is that it examined all, all of four contests, uh, four ranked choice voting contests. In, in 2015, there had already been at least a hundred in, in the last decade in the United States. So I think premising a paper at all on that small of a sample is not a particularly good way to analyze how ranked choice voting elections operate. Um, and second, its focus is uh, these things called exhausted ballots. Those That's the sort of ballot that uh, Dr. Askin was talking about where it's someone had ranked candidates and they their favorite candidates got eliminated. The candidates they ranked got eliminated. This paper takes that to mean these people didn't know what they were doing. They made mistakes. They they have been disenfranchised by the ranked choice voting process. And I don't I don't think that's a particularly like helpful characterization of that sort of information that we get out of ranked choice voting elections, because I think exhausted ballots, sometimes called inactive ballots, uh, mean can mean a very, can mean many different things in a ranked choice voting election. It might mean people ran out of rankings. They wanted to rank more candidates, but they couldn't. But it might also mean there were a lot of voters who showed up who just didn't like any of the other candidates. They voted for some of the candidates. Those candidates didn't win, but, but those voters still got to vote. They still got to cast a ballot and that vote did get counted. Um, and I, I, I just think there's a, there's a more sort of holistic uh, top to bottom way to look at those numbers to, to try and do more to understand the different sorts of things voters are doing on their ballots and, and how voters interact with their ballots and how the, in, the new sorts of information you get from ranked choice voting is really information, interesting and not just to say, this is happening, voters have been disenfranchised. Great, thank you. Uh, a next question I've seen, uh, we've got two questions on the best outreach methods for particular groups of voters. Uh, one person asks how to best reach young voters and first time voters. And another attendee asks, um, how do we reach voters whose uh, first language is not English? Uh, and so I would love to hear your thoughts on messaging to different groups. Maybe uh, we could hand it to David first. Yeah, I definitely have experience uh, with voters who uh, don't speak English as their primary language. Ramsey County has 26% of our residents don't speak English uh, as their primary language. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, first generation Americans living in Ramsey County. So as a result, you have a lot of uh, new voters. You also have a lot of voters uh, in Minnesota, ballots are printed in English. So for those 26% of voters in Ramsey County um, who don't uh, read English or speak English as their primary language, uh, there's obviously, a, can be a little gap there. Um, so in St. Paul, again, this was over 10 years ago, uh, but the city council, I think, uh, allocated about $40,000 that it distributed to, to various groups. I think Fair Vote 
uh, got some of those allocations to really do outreach within the community. And what that was, it was kind of a community-based uh, way of uh, doing outreach and engagement. That, you know, St. Paul, capital city, very large. There's a lot of community organizations uh, already within the city. Uh, let's have them uh, educate their communities. So the St. Paul really kind of, uh, one approach, there was many, but I think the one important to this question was we worked with those different communities to spread the message. Uh, right now, Ramsey County, we have 16 community partners who did census and voter engagement for us in 2020 and 2021. Uh, and one of the messages we expect them to carry uh, is information about uh, how to uh, mark and uh, engage with a ranked voting election if you live in St. Paul. Dr. Askin, anything to add on that question? Well, I think Dave is real ahead of us, um, connected to the voter ed piece on uh, individuals uh, that, uh, you know, don't necessarily learn or, or, or speak in English. Um, that is something that's very common in our, as a border community. We, in our, you know, in our election code, we are required to have our materials in both English and Spanish. But I think you really um, hit on something very specific that is, is really underscores how important it is, is the partnerships that we create in our community. I actually saw on this, uh, on this, this very call that we're this panel that we're doing, I saw several people from um, you know, organizations that we work exhaustively with as much as we can um, that provide education to voters in rural areas in uh, the colonias in, uh, or those who necessarily don't feel comfortable coming to our office. Um, outreach is, is really important. Community centers in some of these, um, you know, in these, these areas are very, very important, but again, having people in our office that speak uh, Spanish has been very helpful as well. So, I mean, we're, I think we're continuing to learn on how to best do that. And um, we're using the things that we've used for general voter education that seem to have worked, outreach, education, going to non-traditional places, having, showing up where people will let us show up and, and talk about voting and the electoral process and registering folks to vote. So all of those things that we already do. Um, and when it comes to youth, we're fortunate in our community that all of these school districts in our, in our county allow us to start, um, you know, registering voters, um, eligible voters, you know, before they graduate from high school. So we're able to get in there early. And this particular year, we were able to talk about ranked choice voting. And they seem to particularly take to it. They seem to get it very quickly. And in fact, we're kind of doing kind of fun ranking stuff on their own. And, and so um, it almost engages them more, it seems like, in, in terms of um, we talk about the spoiler effect and how, you know, ranked choice voting can help with that. If you don't want to quote unquote, you know, what they would see as wasting your vote on this person, if you know they're going to um, lose, but actually you can vote for as many folks as you can put support behind. So all the traditional ways I think that we do, plus the non-traditional ways that we think could be promising, um, we should always pursue those as well. Great, thank you. Uh, next question for Chris. Uh, one of our attendees asks, my impression is that HR1, if passed, would provide grants to upgrade voting systems to be RCV capable. Is the federal government supporting any one particular voting system or piece of technology for ranked choice voting? So that's a, it's a really interesting question. So like I said, during my presentation, all the voting system vendors, their most recent systems have some kind of ranked choice voting built in. But one thing that, uh, as far as I understand it, has held back more development of ranked choice voting capability, something that has kept vendors from really diving in to a ranked choice voting is that there's a lot of variation across different ranked choice voting jurisdictions uh, in how ranked choice voting actually works on the ground level. There's like mild variations in how ballots, what it means if somebody ranks too many candidates at one ranking or skips too many rankings in a row, that sort of thing. Um, not to mention single winner versus proportional ranked choice voting. Um, I say all of that to say there's two answers to this question. HR1 has provisions mentioning ranked choice voting and saying that any, um, it's sort of, it's not so much legally binding as it is a like nice policy signal in the bill. And it says um, all voting systems um, 
certified to federal standards shall uh, include ranked choice voting. It doesn't ex it exactly explain exactly what that means, but but HR one is saying we think people should use ranked choice voting, and um, that means money in that bill will go towards places purchasing ranked choice voting or purchasing equipment that should have ranked choice voting on it, which in theory would also help ranked choice voting adoption. But the really big underlying thing there, the tension still that that, that needs to get mined and that we're working on right now is. There are these things called the vote, uh, the voluntary voting system guidelines, the VVSG. These are the things that essentially set the standards for how um, how voting systems get tested and certified in the United States. Um, every state has adopted them to different extents. Some haven't adopted them at all. Some have gone above and beyond uh, those standards, but they're the things that sort of set the tone. And for the longest time, they didn't include a lot of ranked choice voting information. Um, but I've been working with my colleague, George Gilbert for the last now five years actually on the VVSG 2.0, which is this huge update to these federal guidelines and standards. Um, and we've made sure to, um, among all the work we've done uh, on that, um, we've made sure to include uh, really extensive information about how ranked choice voting gets run, all the different details of ranked choice voting implementation in every jurisdiction across the state or across the country so that vendors have a single unified resource they can refer to if they're designing systems so that they know uh, in really precise detail how to do this right and how to do it well. Um, and part of that work has also been our development of our software, the universal ranked choice voting tabulator, which can run ranked choice voting elections according to the rules uh, used in any ranked choice voting jurisdiction in the United States. Um, so we, we've we developed that in tandem with the development of those VVSG requirements to make sure we're capturing all of that variation. Though there uh, are a few updates we need to make before we can get used in St. Paul and it, there, the voting system testing process itself is very rigorous. We are a very small component of what would be a much larger overall system. So we, um, we're we being essentially subject to those requirements in New York State right now, and we're doing everything we can to meet those requirements, but they're a little bit inapposite to our, to our software. So we're, I think the next thing we need to figure out is how do we get incorporated into every vendor system so that they can go out and get that tool out to everybody as broadly as possible um, so that there's an easy, fast way in to ranked choice voting if a jurisdiction wants to run a ranked choice voting election. I hope that made sense. This stuff gets so technical. That was very helpful. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Uh, we are just about out of time. I would like to pose one last question to each of the panelists and then we will uh, wrap things up. So a final question. Um, if you could give just one piece of advice or guidance to a election administrator just starting out with RCV, what would it be? Uh, let's start with David, then go to Dr. Askin, then to Chris. Uh, my first piece of advice uh, for anybody here, if, if you want more information, just send me an email. I don't mind talking with anybody uh, on this uh, Zoom call further if you have more questions. Uh, my one piece of advice is no fear. I grew up in the 90s. No fear was a big thing. It, it wasn't that hard, actually. The voters didn't have a lot of questions. Uh, once we got it off the ground, it didn't really amend the labor of my staff or myself. Um, it really was a lot easier um, than we thought it was. But again, that was 10 years. So hindsight's 2020. So thanks for having me. I am going to absolutely, I grew up in the 90s as well, Dave. So um, I would say that we have to give voters a little more credit than we think. I think fear often is the thing that'll drive us to be like, oh, voters are gonna think this and they're gonna do that. And and there are those cases, but we did some um, you know, post-election um, you know, surveys and the majority, I would say, 65% of people um, ranked their full val ballot, and that was including the nine, right? Um, people were comfortable with it uh, for the most part, right? I mean, there were some good surveys that showed us that all of our fears that, I should speak for myself, my fears that were like, oh, voters are, 
they were, um, there was some of that, but in the bigger picture, voters got it. They ran with it. And for the most part, they liked it more than you might think they would just based on the fact that it's changed. So um, that is kind of what I, what my two cents is. I don't, I don't know if I have anything really to add to that. I, I, I feel like it's not, I'm not an election administrator. I've not run an election before. I, I feel like it's not my place to tell election administrators what a piece of advice is. But I think um, if I, honestly, I can't think of anything, but if I think of something, I'll throw it in the chat. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Uh, it is about 5.01, so let's wrap this up. Uh, thank you so much to our panelists for being here. Your expertise is absolutely essential and we appreciate you sharing your stories with us. And thank you to all of the attendees who gave us an hour of your time this evening. Uh, this webinar was recorded and we'll be adding it to the Fair Vote YouTube page this week. Anyone who has RSVP'd to this event will receive a follow-up email with that resource. And as a reminder, of course, the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center is ready to be a resource if and when you are ready to administer your first Ranked Choice election. So you can always contact them by visiting rcvresources.org. And lastly, visit Fair Vote's website for more upcoming webinars in our spring webinar series, topics about how RCV benefits communities of color, the Fair Representation Act, and how advocates are building support for RCV across the country. Once again, thank you all for being here and thank you so much to the panelists. Thank you. Yep, take care, everybody. <laughs>